Joining me today is Adrian Ash from Bullion Vault, a uh, precious metal dealer storage firm. Adrian, uh, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks for asking me, Simon. Uh, the first uh, thing I like to ask people that we interview um, is basically how you got into uh, the markets, financial markets, and particular gold. Okay, well, I was ooh, about 15 years ago. Um, I got involved with a company called Agora that you might know, Agora Inc. They're a big newsletter publishers in the States. Sure. Um, and I actually started out working on their business titles, uh, some of their tax advisory stuff for uh, small businesses here in the UK. And then I moved on to their financial titles right around the time of the tech stock crash. So that was good fun. Uh, Trying to looking for equities that were good value, of which there were a few long term. But uh, at the time, it was it was a tough sell. Um, but I then moved on to being head of editorial there, uh, and I also began working on the Daily Reckoning with Bill Bonner, which I'm sure you know. Um, sure. Uh, and I I ran their uh, UK edition of that for about. Oh God, four or five years, uh, and as part of that, I mean, really around 2001, I started to become very interested in precious metals. Uh, they seemed to represent me uh, outstanding value at the time, very overlooked, hated, completely beaten down. You know, when you had New York Times asking who needs gold, when you've got Alan Greenspan, and at the same time you had Gordon Brown here in London selling half of the UK's gold. It, you know, it seemed to be worth a look because governments, when they sell something for ideological reasons always sell it under market price. You know, we'd seen the same thing in the UK with privatization throughout the 80s and 90s. Gold was definitely worth a look. So I began writing about gold, recommending gold, investing in gold myself about well, it's more than 10 years ago now. And then, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, th that's that's great. Thanks for, for that introduction. Um, so you got into the gold market in 2001. You joined uh, Bullion Vault in uh, 2006, I think you said. Yeah. Um, is your view, you know, when you, you were talking about, you know, part of the reason you were interested in gold in 2001 was that it was pretty contrarian. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it had been at a, a really declined uh, significantly, you know, at that point, mm -hmm. well off of its uh, 1980s highs. Uh, Sort of, what's your approach to the markets? I mean, um, are you are you in and out? Is it technicals? Are you coming from the Austrian economics background that a lot of uh, people in gold are are interested in? What's your sort of analytic uh, background from? Well, for myself, it's buy and hold. I mean, I'm you know, it's I I do you know I am uh, fairly certain that we are going to see a you know a major crack in um, major currencies, particularly sovereign bond markets, at some point. Um, I expect it to happen within my lifetime, um, you know, and I, I do hope that my kids are going to be able to pick up the pieces on the other side of that. Um, Armageddon, of course, if you keep looking for it, is constantly deferred. So, you know, as a buy and hold investor in gold, I think you know, there are a lot of other good reasons to look at it as well. Um, certainly from my own point of view, and I think for a lot of bullion bolt users, pending that crisis, gold has proven to be a very good hedge and a safe haven over the last 10 years, particularly the last five. I myself, I'm not in and out that often. Um, I'm not a good trader. I'm, you know, calling the highs and lows in the market. If there's a nice trend there that I can see, and I've called the summer low pretty well a couple of times over the last few years. You know how gold typically has a, you know, a dip going into the summer, uh, and then picks up again on September 1st, kind of like clockwork. Uh, that was all going pretty well for me. I, you know, looked to get out on a spike and then come back in on the low until last year when I thought I'd get really smart and I got out in June 2011. Uh, and then had real trouble getting back in until December when the price of course had come back down to what was it, 15.30 on the dollar. Uh, so in sterling terms we were back below 1,000 the ounce, which was a nice opportunity for the, you know, to recover the mistake I'd made earlier in the year. So I'm no trader on this. Um, and certainly in terms of bullion bolt users, I mean, you know, those of, who have been with us for the last six, seven years now, um, the only way really for a customer of bullion bolt to have lost money is to have traded and got it wrong every time. You know, the bull market has been there. Trading in and out is great if you can do it. Um, but I do think that whilst Bullion Vault allows you and enables you to trade, you can access the spread, you know, you've got full control over your orders. There is a danger, I think, for perhaps um, less experienced traders that the biggest risk is over trading. We all know that, right? Sure. Um, okay, so you're coming at it from a, uh, a buy and hold mentality. Um, you know, basically, it sounds like you you timed the entry well. 2001 was, you know, one of the, maybe the best time to get in. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, what are what are your thoughts on you know you mentioned the sovereign debt crisis being uh, a major driver or one of the things that you know and this is I'm holding gold you know for largely the same reason I see the the sovereign debt is clearly unsustainable or you know it, it seems one could argue it's unsustainable especially with the, the fact that it's growing um, yeah. So, how? Uh, what are your thoughts on like how much longer do you think you'll end up holding gold? Is this and also related to that, when it comes time to exit, you know, are you looking for a mania to sell into, or do you think gold's going to get remonetized? What are your thoughts on uh, on when will it be time for this trade to end? I mean, that is, you know, that's the what are we at? Eight trillion dollar question, really. Right. Uh, <laughs> where. I think the may I think I know, I think you're right, Simit. That it, you know most people who are in the gold market or have been for a while, and most people who who spend uh, spend time looking at this think that the, it will go one of those two routes. You're either going to have some kind of mania blow off, uh, which will be very difficult for anybody to quit. Waiting for that big top. I mean, how many people actually took profits at 850 the ounce in January of 1980? And how many of those who did then didn't go back in as gold belong began its kind of twenty year decline? Very difficult on that big mania to, to really call it. And I think it's only those people who have been in for a while. And so I mean I you know, I'm I'm looking at this still, I think, with a five, ten year horizon. I think in terms of the big cycle here, you know, the credit bust that we've had in the last five years, if you look at particularly how the gold prices moved in Euros, it only started to go up in two thousand five. You know, it's you know you could say well we're more than a decade into this, but I think when you look at the oversold level gold of that and silver as well back at the turn of the century, you know it had a long way to come back up. It probably will overshoot. The alternative scenario again, I think you're right to, to raise that is that gold and silver actually become more constant features of the financial landscape. I personally think that's more likely. I think that if you look at the long sweep of history, what you had. 15, 20 years ago, uh, was an aberration. I mean, this was, you know, this was the the real oddity was to actually have gold and silver spurned to that extent. What will kill? What will kill the bull market? You know, what will kill the the attraction of gold for people? The bottom line on that is is real interest rate. It's what did for gold and silver at the turn of the 1980s, uh, and I really do think that actually on the ground, it's what's been driving bull market in gold for Western investors in particular in the last 10 years is that returns to cash, returns to bonds, uh, by extension returns to equities, because if you're in a low interest rate environment, then obviously dividend yields are going to be really poor as well, um, mean that people are, uh, are having to look at other things, having to look outside of what have become called traditional asset classes, and they're really not. We're talking about you know, derivative products, packaged financial services, and so on. But the returns to those have become so poor, and interest rates now at zero, nominal, Minus two and three percent in real terms after inflation. That's really what's been driving um, people to choose gold and silver instead and drive the price higher. I don't think it's until you see real returns on cash of four and five percent, such as you had on average throughout the 80s and 90s, that you'll actually see you know the real big turn coming. Okay. In terms of um, you know, you mentioned for instance you're you're looking for. Yields, you know, like four to five percent. Now we're basically a negative, uh, yeah. you know, real interest rates. Um, I mean, is there? I guess is there a currency that you think you know the euro gets a lot of attention uh, of late? The yen has been getting more attention, at least amongst those who are really uh, sort of following that. Although the yen has been, you know, the thing that's hasn't been worked out for twenty years. Now might be it. It is. It does seem like the ticking time bomb from yep. so many different perspectives, demographics that. Debt GDP. Uh, is there a? I mean, what are your thoughts on? Are, are all these currencies just going to collapse, or are you looking? Is there a step by step on how you're seeing this sovereign debt unfold? Or who do you think, or if you think, uh, have an opinion on this at all, as to uh, you know which country is going to get its act together first and sort of uh, approach positive interest rates? Well, I mean, the problem is from monetary policy point of view that nobody wants to have the currency, which Strengthens and does well. You'll remember, we're talking barely three years ago, two years ago almost, that eurozone politicians were complaining about the strength of the euro. You know, Nicolas Sarkozy was saying, you know, we can't afford to have a strong euro. German manufacturers are complaining about the strong euro against the dollar. Well, they got their wish, um, but they got it in a very weird way. Um, I think, with regards to my own currency, sterling, 
you know, it looks horribly overvalued. I think the UK actually looks a lot like Japan did 20 years ago. The cost of living is very high. Um, the financial assets, and particularly housing, are horribly overvalued, and the deflation really hasn't begun. Um, and there is a, a resistance at the policy level to allowing that liquidation to come through. It's very easy for Keynesian economists to say, well, you know, this is horrible liquidationist theory from the 1930s. But I do think that, you know, quite clearly there's too much money in the world, and some of that money is going to have to get destroyed because, you know, the values that have been built up, you know, it's, there's just too many monetary units. And on each side of um, a debt, such as governments have, there is a creditor. Uh, and so what you're going to get is you're going to get creditors being destroyed. This is how all credit bubbles end, is the creditors pay, because the creditors are the ones with the money. The debtors won't pay because they haven't got any money. So, you know, that's why I think the bond markets look like a long-term sell. Calling the top in bonds, obviously, has been a full down for the last couple of years. Um, but I do think that you are going to see this kind of cascade with the focus of stress moving from one currency to the other. We've already seen this. If you look at it through the gold price, you saw it in the dollar through the early part of the last decade, with the gold price in dollars really moving. You then saw, as I say, the euro gold price turning higher in 2005 as the bull market started to broaden out. Um, the pound got absolutely destroyed on purpose by the Bank of England in 2007-2008, and that's when the gold price for sterling households, sterling savers, really took a big leg up. Um, then the focus back on the dollar now, it's onto the euro, and it just kind of moves around that none of these currencies wish to take the lead, none of these currencies wish to be the strongest, and all central banks are doing together, and this includes the emerging markets, this includes China, this includes India, because nobody wants to have a strong currency. So I think you're right that somebody has to end up wearing it, um, but we know the Swiss are very resistant. The Swiss don't want to be that guy. Uh, they're you know export heavy economy, so that it, it's very difficult to see how, in a world of all central banks actively looking to devalue their own currencies, gold and silver don't go higher long term. Do you think you know on the subject of basically we have the competitive devaluations uh, where that, that's the yeah, environment now? Problem. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I mean, do you think you know someone like you know, like you mentioned, someone has to you know, someone's going to have to raise or accept a strong currency? Mm -hmm. um, do you think the IMF's going to get involved? And do you think you know there's that viewpoint that the IMF's going to get involved, and that's how gold will get remonetized? Do you have do you have any thoughts on that? I politically, I don't believe the IMF are going to, or any of the Western authorities are going to really be looking to include gold as a major plank of any kind of new monetary system. I don't really think there's much appetite actually for rebuilding a system with formal rules and so on. Um, I think that appetite might come back in due course when you start to get exchange controls. If you look at how Bretton Woods worked after the Second World War, you had to have the shutters down on all these different economies so that money could be kept in. If you won't defend the value of currency with stronger interest rates, but you don't want to have a collapse, then you have to bring down the exchange control shutters. Um, I think ideologically and politically we're still quite away from that at the moment. The IMF has started to make more encouraging noises about exchange controls. They've said that exchange controls for emerging economies who are subject to hot money inflows, well, that's okay. You know, since we saw with Brazil a couple of years ago where they basically put a, an extra withholding tax on foreign money that was investing in the country, they would take up more of your profit, more of your, your dividends or whatever. Um, and that's a step towards it. But I don't see gold, therefore, being encouraged into the system by these guys, because what they're actually trying to do is to manage uh, wealth within the existing system as it is. And it's a relatively free floating system. I think they'd like to try and maintain that. Um, I don't see gold, as I say, really being put forward as a major solution by any monetary authority or any political authority anytime soon. Certainly not in the West. Uh, I do think that in China, we know the Chinese authorities are hoarding. We know that um, we know Chinese households have been accumulating huge quantities of gold over the last few years. We know that there is a very strong cultural affiliation, affiliation with gold in China, which has only just been allowed to come back in the last 10 years. It's economies, historically, which have been strong and growing and accumulating a lot of privately held gold, which have um, moved on to some kind of formalized 
monetary standard for than gold. So, you know, there is a possibility, but I think it's a long way down the line because, again, China is very much a bureaucratic regime. The idea of actually having free market gold as being some kind of monetary standard is anathema to how these guys run the country. Sure. Um, in terms of, um, you know, silver, you mentioned that uh, a bit earlier, and Bullion Vault, uh, you know, does provide silver storage as well as gold storage. Uh, do you, are you coming from the perspective that the two are going to move together? Um, do you have any preference for one? Do you, I mean, there's that perspective that silver is just a more volatile version of gold. There are some people who are really bullish on silver, and other people think that, you know, silver won't, that gold will get remonetized, silver won't, and then, you know, silver is almost like an illusion. What are your thoughts on, uh, on how to play silver, how to incorporate it, how it relates to gold, and, and that whole subject? Well, I mean, gold and silver move together on a daily basis all the time. I mean, you're not going to find two financial assets which have a closer correlation. I think you can count on one hand the number of times in the last 40 years that gold and silver have gone in opposite directions for more than two days running. I mean, they, you know, they're just joined at the hip on a daily basis, but they do have different characteristics as a financial, you know, as an asset, um, as a non, you know, as, as a non-financial asset. Um, silver is clearly far more useful useful industrially than gold. About 60% of annual demand for silver goes to industrial production uses, solar panels, you know, biocides and so on now coming through. Um, gold just doesn't have that level of use. It's below 15% the last couple of years that gold offtake goes into industry. So I do think that when you see um, financial markets take a hit, let's take Lehman's as an example, or Silver and gold both fell together, so they should. That makes sense because there was a lot of inflationary money coming out of the futures market in both of those. You know, there's a lot of credit being destroyed. If a big investment bank vanishes, credit has evaporated. So the futures market price of both fell very hard. But silver fell very much faster than gold and very much harder because, of course, it's exposed to industrial and GDP growth in a way that gold isn't. I do think that when we do see a turn, and possibly if we do get the kind of much stronger inflation, which a lot of gold investors think is coming pretty near down the line now, um, silver will look like a very attractive play. I think if you have a kind of inflationary industrial boom in the West, be it financed through new fiscal deficits, be it financed through um, you know, new central bank easing, directed at, purposely directed at, is the corporate borrowing, then I think you know you could see that kind of Weimar situation of corporations spending all the money that they've hoarded in the last couple of years very quickly to accumulate assets, or factories, capital investments, and that may well take silver very much higher very quickly. Um, what you do have, though, is there is a situation I think with silver that when it captures the imagination, and we saw this in spring 2011. Sorry, I'm going to have to take this. Sorry. I'll roll back a bit. I do think with silver, with the silver market, what you do get, though, is when it captures the imagination, particularly of private individuals, private investors, um, but also a lot of fund managers, and we saw this in spring of 2011, it really captures the imagination. I think the, the fact of the silver market being really quite small, it's about one-sixth the size by value of the gold market. Um, so it's you know it's relatively contained, and then when it takes off, obviously the more money you put a billion dollars into gold today it won't touch the side. You put a billion dollars into silver, it'll show. Um, and so I think there is that very speculative element on silver. Uh, and I think if you look at recent history, you know from the Hunt brothers to Warren Buffett trying to corner the market in silver, the fact that it's that bit smaller, people do try and you know shut this thing down and say right, you know, here's something which I can actually control in 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 entirety. Um, that speculative element, absolutely, you know, the price can move very, very quickly indeed. Um, in terms of, you know, one of the big things that people, especially, especially in the silver community, but also, you know, there's definitely people in, in gold that have this view, uh, and it relates very much to how bullion vault structures it's offering with allocated gold and, and such. Mm -hmm. um, but do you, what are your thoughts on, you know, the idea that the futures exchanges don't have the metals that they're they're accounted for. That central banks don't have. <laughs> that there's just a whole bunch of lying, basically. Uh, and then there's a lot less. And all these people that claim the exchanges, the central banks that claim they have all this metal, um, but they don't actually have it. Do you think that's there's truth to that? And you know, related to that, or for people that are uh, that go down that that path, 
a natural ex expectation is of a short squeeze in those markets. So there are a lot of people that are positioning, you know, accumulating physical gold and silver because they know once the the lie, the scam is exposed, and that there isn't these metals available, the price is just going to, you know, move up significantly, very quickly. Uh, do you give credence to that view, or, or what are your thoughts on that whole subject? Well, I personally don't buy it, um, but that's not to mean that's not to say that you know there isn't you know some elements of, of reality in it. In which case, I think if you're buying gold and silver for all the other good reasons that there are, then you're kind of getting that trade for free on top. The situation with the exchanges, the comics, and so on is that if you're going to trade futures, if you're going to trade derivatives, then you aren't trading the physical anyway. So the idea that the price is being manipulated in the futures market and that somehow that is suppressing the physical price of gold or silver long term, day to day, of course it happens because the tail wags the dog on this. If gold is falling for three month delivery, then of course the price today will fall, the spot price will fall. I mean, this will happen. You know, that's where you know the leverage trading is going on. So that's where, you know, for the sake of one dollar down, I can control a hundred dollars worth of gold or whatever. That's where hedge funding will play. As I say, the tail will wag the dog on that. But it's not going to do it very long term when you consider about what the actual sources of physical demand and supply are. You know, when you look at Chinese households, Indian households, you know, I mean that's the bigger story here. Uh, Western investment demand. Obviously, if Western households are buying gold for investment as a safe haven, as a hedge, rather than buying it as jewelry, as a trinket, then they will pay more for it. I mean, that's you know, you're changing the nature of the object that you're investing in. Um, so I just don't buy the idea that long-term suppression can actually work, and the idea that central banks or investment banks could be suppressing the price by somehow selling gold and silver which don't exist. It's very easy to call the bluff on that and just say, fine, take delivery, which is what Bullion Vault has always done. You know, we, we do not do any unallocated, we don't do any credit, physical gold and silver inside the vault, and that's it. It's all accounted for in the daily bar list, which we publish from the custodians that we employ. We then have a, a daily reconciliation of that bar list with our customer holdings, so that you can see that every customer's gold is there inside the vault down to the last gram. And it reconciles exactly with the bar list from the independent custodian. And then we have a physical audit done every year by professional assayers who go in, they count all the bars, they check them, they inspect them, and then they basically confirm or otherwise everything is correct. Uh, we just had the audit done inside of our financial year end for 2012. They were satisfied with all the bars, a couple of bar numbers need changing, a couple of data entry errors on, the, um, on things, and that's what the audit is for, is to catch those things. If you are going to trade the futures market, I think you should expect to get squeezed in and out because the big heavy hands here, the guys, the investment banks, the, you know, the hedge funds, they're, they, they're the big money. And the idea that it's somehow wrong or immoral for them to control the price, well, this is a market, and the bigger hands will control the market. Now, central banks is an interesting point. What are central banks doing in the gold market right now? Well, there's two kinds of central bank. I mean, there's Western central banks who were selling. We know they were actively selling. We know they were actively leasing so that the mining companies hedge forward their production back in the 90s. Bank of England, for instance, when Gordon Brown announced his big gold sale in the turn of 1990, well, mid-1999, the Bank of England actually had more gold out on lease than he was going to sell. So not only did he give the market two months notice, but he had also given the market enough gold to actually get out there and get short with the very same gold he had to sell anyway. So, you know, you could call that, is that fool or knave? I mean, personally, my view of all politicians is these guys are stupider than they are. Uh, right. <laughs> but it looks like a conspiracy because it's so, you know, it's so cack-handed, it's so badly managed, it's so mismanaged, and, and the loss to the Treasury, to the, to the UK taxpayer is enormous. Has all that gold come back? I don't know. I don't know. And if you ask the central banks, they're not going to tell you. Um, auditing the Fed gold, I think, makes perfect sense. And I think for the longer that these guys delay that and they, you know, they rebut that, then okay, they've managed to see off Ron Paul now. Okay, Ron Paul is, you know, he he leaves the Senate next year, uh, and he hasn't had that audit done, which I think is a real shame. But why are they not doing this? Um, either they do have something to hide. Or it's just miserably bad PR, and these guys need some PR training about, you know, there's a perfectly valid question here. The same with Germany's gold. You know, there's a large chunk of Germany's uh, federal reserves are actually in the US, some is in London. Fine, get it audited. Um, you know, it's, there's no reason, I think, in what we still believe to be a democratic Western civilization that we have for this not to be done. You know, there is no rational reason for that to happen. Do central banks operate in the, in the gold and silver market? Certainly the gold market, yes. 
Um, I mean, they have a lot of gold. Why have not? And the leasing market, of course, is where a lot of the action comes for the investment banks. Uh, I mean, you know, if you talk to the, the head traders from some of the big investment banks that we meet at the London Bullion Market Association conferences that we go to, guys that we talk to, we talk to the market, they would love a bit of leasing to come back into the market. You know, they, made, they made good money in the late 90s when the gold price was falling by doing forwards, options, swaps, doing all this good stuff which investment banks love. What has really come to hurt their trading desks in the last couple of years is that the market, both in the West and particularly in the Far East, has moved towards physical. People want physical, they want allocated, they want it delivered. Um, there's not a lot of margin in that for investment banks. So, you know, for these guys, the market has come full circle now. It looks much more like an old bullion banking business to them. So you might imagine that, you know, the gold trading teams at the investment banks have had a whale of a time in the last five years. They really haven't. Most of them have shrunk. A couple of them have been closed. Royal Bank of Scotland closed its precious metal unit earlier this year um, because there isn't the margin that the investment banks look for. You know, the four and five percent up front, which I like to take on a derivatives trade. They can't do that on physical bullion. So that's why I believe companies like Bullion Vault, uh, Gold Money, and other companies who are doing good things in our space, we've kind of had the field left open to us by the established banking sector because we just don't charge enough and we've, we've whittled away whatever margin those guys would have wanted to take. 